Hello friends, uh, welcome to DeWasteWise. I am Shweta Vindapani. I am the community builder at DeWasteWise. And today we have a webinar titled Marine Pollution, a Caribbean Perspective, where we have Sean Kaffee Young, who's a waste management educator, consultant, and social entrepreneur moderating the panel. Uh, Sean came up with this topic based on the audience questions from the earlier panel that she moderated, which was about waste management from the Caribbean perspective. If you have not seen that panel, please go to the video panel section of our website and you will find it there. Uh, Sean has put together another great panel today because we have three guests from three different Caribbean islands to weigh in on the subject. We have Tamoy St. Clark, who's the program assistant at United Nations Environment Program, and she's from Jamaica. We have Lavina Alexander, who's a Sustainable Development and Environment Officer at Sustainable Development and Environment Division of St. Lucia. And we have Dr. Legina Henry, who's a lecturer for renewable energy at University of West Indies, Cape Hill. Uh, we have received the questions that you sent out in advance and uh, the panelists are already aware of the questions, so they will leave it into the conversation or Sean will ensure that the question is posed to them. Over and above, please use the Q&A section. Please post your questions in Q&A. Please don't post them in chat. Post them in Q&A and uh, the panelists will pick up the question as and when it is relevant to the conversation. So over to you, Sean. Thank you very much, uh, Suitha, and hello to everybody. Thank you so much for joining um, our webinar today on marine litter in the Caribbean, as Suitha mentioned. This, some questions came up in our last webinar that we were talking about, generally how we manage waste in the Caribbean. Um, and there was a particular interest uh, regarding marine waste, waste entering the marine environment and how that is managed in the Caribbean as well. So welcome again to everyone. So I would start our discussion with our panelists, just as I normally do, asking them to tell you guys a bit more about what they do uh, with respect to managing uh, waste in the marine environment. So I will start with uh, Ms. Tamoy Clark first. So Tamoy, please go ahead and share the Jamaican experience and what you do in terms of marine litter. Hi, good morning, everyone. Okay, uh, my name is Tamoy Singh Clark. I am a program assistant with the UNEP Cartagena um, Convention Secretariat. My work involves um, assisting the secretary with fulfilling their mandate under the Cartagena Convention, specifically as it relates to the land-based sources of marine pollution protocol, and especially protected areas and wildlife protocol. And of course, um, for the ap applicable to this webinar, we'll be speaking on the Elbes Protocol, which is more applicable to pollution from ships, pollution from um, marine source, land-based sources and activities, as well as pollution from dumping. And regarding my background, I have worked um, in the NGO sector primarily, focusing on environmental education and environmental law advocacy. I have done work um, in managing waste through national coordination of International Coastal Cleanup Day, as well as through training of community persons on proper beach management and also public education around solid waste management in Jamaica. Thank you. Thank you to my Ms. Lavina Alexander. Lavina, please share this, your experience in St. Lucia. Hi, good morning all. Lavina Alexander employed with the Department of Sustainable in Development in St. Lucia as a Sustainable Development and Environment Officer with responsibility for ocean governance and coastal zone management. The government of St. Lucia, we have noticed that marine pollution poses a big problem, particularly to tourism on the island. And we are taking measures to address marine litter in St. Lucia. I am also the focal point for the LBS protocol in St. Lucia, again, to determine how we can use marine litter 
management as an effective means of sustainable development in Tenusha. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lavina. Dr. Henry? So Dr. Henry is Trinidadian who's based in Barbados. <laughs> so Dr. Henry, please share with us your work through the University of the West Indies, Kefil campus. Yeah, hi everyone, good morning. I'm happy to be here. Um, I am the Renewable Energy Lecturer at UE Cave Hill. And so yes, I'm a Trinidadian We're living and working in Barbados for the past two and a half years. And recently, within the last four months, I actually joined a marine plastic project where we're looking, we, we actually doing it in a very academic way. So we're starting with lit review of what, what are the solutions, what are the descriptions of this marine plastic problem in the world and particular to the Caribbean region. And we're trying, as a team of uh, different um, experts and we all have different perspectives and trying to think of what would be one of the most effective solutions now for the Caribbean region. And we're at the stage of lit review right now, understanding the problem, stepping back from it, seeing it from a wide perspective. Um, beyond that, my work is as a renewable energy expert, looking at ways to find, um, ways to stop bringing old fossilized carbon back into our biosphere and using what is already here. So um, um, Shan would know one of my major projects now is, is a sargassum um, energy research project where we're trying to use sargassum to come up with a transportation fuel solution for Barbados. But um, when I look at the marine plastic problem, I see it also through the lens of renewable energy and ways of using the um, microplastics and the recovered plastics from the ocean in some kind of energy solution. Yes, and as you as you mentioned, uh, Dr. Henry, that's because that's exactly how we met. I was on a webinar that she was on, <laughs> um, and she was talking about her work with sargassum seaweed and using that to convert energy. Because that was one of the questions that we got asked before. So, can you share a little bit more about that project um, and the work with sargassum oh, yeah. as you have before? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, we are we've for the past two years we've tested sargassum seaweed harvested in Barbados with um, local rum distillery wastewater and other sources of bacteria and we produce um, biomethane. Uh, so right now we are at the stage of calculating how much sargassum would be needed if say we wanted to just run 80% of the cars in Barbados on the methane produced from anaerobic digestion of sargassum seaweed. So um, we're at calculations stage. We actually, I started with small micro um, digester experiments designed by Dr. Nikolai Holder at UE Cave Hill. And now we've moved up to larger um, anaerobic digesters produced by Home Biogas in, in Israel. So we just shipped in a couple of those systems. And this summer we're gonna run 5,000 liter tests. Our next step is to actually run a car on it. Right now in Trinidad, the um, CNG is, white, is, a, is a technology that a lot of people use to drive in Trinidad, compressed natural gas. It's the same technology that I would use to drive on biomethane from sargassum. So uh, uh, parallel to doing the tests on the sargassum and the gas coming out of it, we're looking at doing some implementations in Barbados with CNG technology so we could test a fleet of 100 cars or so in the next year um, running on methane produced from the sargassum in Barbados. Because yeah. the, the, so that is part of us projecting upward to a big okay. widespread, wide scale solution from sargassum. Okay, because the, the mechanisms of, in terms of how the CNG, um, well, of course we call the CNG kits as we call them, um, yeah. because yeah. it means retrofitting the engines. Yeah. So, the tech, the CNG technology, then this is also just to, for clarification, and so I understand, yeah. um, is able the the methane gas is able to be utilized within that CNG system. Yeah, then. It, okay, it is. great. In fact, it's okay. actually better for the car because the CNG we get from the fossil fuels is a more varied kind of product, whereas the the, the methane out of a plant being anaerobic digested 
is pure methane gas. The, the, the gas is pure methane, no other um, elements in there. And so it's, it's actually healthier for your engine and your, your car system. So, yeah. That would be great. I don't mind driving a car powered by methane from sarcasm at all. <laughs> I don't mind. Um, and then another project that I was made aware of a couple of years ago um, at UV St. Augustine in Trinidad, um, there was a young lecturer who was working on using sargassum to create bioplastics. Plastics, yeah. I actually got, I went to his opening um, lecture about it to just share the beginning findings of his work. Um, and I got, he gave away some little you know, pieces. So of course that is integrated by now, that's years ago. <laughs> um, but you know, it just goes to, because one of the questions that came up was challenges associated with sargassum because as a Caribbean region, we have a lot of sargassum reaching our shores. Trinidad is no different. Um, so it's really nice to hear about different projects coming along um, where that is concerned. Timoy or Lavina, do you guys have any projects in Jamaica or St. Lucia as we're on the topic of sargassum before we move on? Um, where you guys are as well, do you have, in, are there any active projects that you know of using sargassum seaweed? Timoy, you can go first. Okay, in terms of um, sargassum seaweed, um, there are there have been projects that have been implemented by um, different organizations, including, for example, Inter-American Development Bank. There has been entrepreneurs that have looked at sargassum seaweed as organic animal feed, for example, as well as for use as an alternative to coal, which they refer to as e-coal. Of course, the issue with managing sargassum or having or, or with in terms of um, availability of sargassum is that you cannot um, estimate what the influx will be. So in terms of uh, pri any private sector investment in large scale projects to um, cover or to, to eliminate the issue, it is a bit difficult to address. However, those are the kind of projects that we see a lot of it coming out where you do have persons who want to um, see how best they can manage the sargassum to using it to, for alternative sources. Okay, great. And Lavina, uh, there, do you know of any, uh, the only project that I know of, let me, let me give you a little bit of a precursor, is there's Algas, I think the brand is Algas by <laughs> or something like that. The young man who created it is St. Lucian, if my memory serves me correctly. So, uh, so you could um, talk a little bit more about that or any other um, initiative with sarcasm before we move on to the topic of the microplastics as well. Yeah, like you mentioned, Algas Organics makes um, well, organic material from sarcasm as well as the National Conservation Authority is charged with training persons. They have trained a significant number in the collection of the seaweed before it is processed into whatever materials they have determined. But Algas Organics is very successful. Great. Yeah, because we actually sell an here in Trinidad, you know. So that's how I, I that's how I know about it because a friend of a friend of a friend is selling it. <laughs> Um, and I asked about what it. Is, what is it? What is what is our gas organics? Is it just some um, like they're making, they're making fertilizer from sargassum okay. So there was some um, collection of it off the coast and processing into I um from what, from what I know of it, it's bottled in a li in liquid form, um, Dr. Henry, um, okay. and it's sold as a biofertilizer. So, so you're saying this it, is in St. Lucia, St. Lucia? Yes, the person who created it is a young man, is an entrepreneur from St. Lucia, that particular brand. Um, and we yeah. are also, uh, one of my colleagues in the agricultural sector is a distributor for it in Trinidad. So it is here in Trinidad as an alternative 
Um, so we have compost, we have that as an option, um, and we have some other organic fertilizers on the market. But that's how I found out about it because I have a few friends who are farmers um, yeah. and I'm very, very keen to know how they um, fertilize, how they nurture their crops, which fertilizers they use and the transition from the traditional fertilizers to organic fertilizers. So that's how I was a part and found out about that through that conversation. Yeah. And it's been very successful. Yes, he's, he's from what I've heard, it's, it's doing very, very well. So, you know, so, so um, for those of you who are listening, you see we have some successful projects um, using the sargassum seaweed. So the challenge that Timoy brought up again is we don't know about the quantities that will be coming in to have, uh, we can guesstimate based on can I say? years and trends. Yeah, but can I can I just jump in and add to that? Oh, sure, so sure. In 2018 and in 2019, there were scientists in the University of Maryland and then another scientist, um, Wu, I think his last name is Wu. He's, he published um, in 2019 projections of the sargassum seaweed in the um, in the whole Caribbean Sea. So I think part of it is as Caribbean people, we know sometimes they go to Manzanella and it's just seaweed everywhere, but sometimes they go on it's great. And yeah. in your mind, you attach this thing that is unpredictable when you're gonna see sargassum, but that's on the beach. The fact is within our very large exclusive economic zones, which most Caribbean countries are more water than land, within right. the whole exclusive economic zone of a Caribbean nation, island nation, you can actually, you've come down to these algorithms that could exactly predict um, the influx of sargassum. And in fact, I'm on a mailing list now out to UE Cave Health through, I think, Hazel Oxen, but that is a sargassum watch where they kind of tell us what to expect over the next what, one week or two weeks in terms of sargassum. But the models are even more exact than that coming out to the big universities where you'll have an oceanography department where you'll have physical oceanographers, bi biological oceanographers, um, chemical oceanographers using all kinds of different techniques to predict how much sargassum. And so you could put that in economic models if say you wanted to scale up and have, okay. um, say um, our gas organics wanted to scale up and predict um, profits over a, a period, then yeah, you could actually, um, it's not as unpredictable as we first thought. Uh, there's enough going on right now that it's becoming more predictable um, using methods that are tested and, and, and tried within the oceanography community. So I would say that question of it's not predictable is we're moving away from that and, and becoming more um, analytical about understanding what to expect in terms of sargassum influx. And that's and that's excellent news. Um, because you know, I am um, I tell people I'm always a student, so I'm always willing to learn. That's why you ladies are here because y'all are teaching me this as much as yeah, you I'm know really I mean, because I'm not immersed in the sector, so I don't know. But yes, I'm really, really happy to hear that we have better predictive models that can be used um to the to give us a good idea of what, or an excellent idea of what is what is expected. So therefore, for those of us who have the entrepreneurial spirit and want to um, do something with the seaweed, we can get that data to support our decision-making. I was talking about the importance of data just up to yesterday, um, the fact that I'm a data nerd and mm. I like having information to make informed decisions. I am in waste, um, but there are a number of things that I would like to do, but we have some data voids with respect to certain forms of data, specifically organic waste. So I have embarked on my own little mission to gather data, um, but it would be nice to be able to get that done on a larger scale. So maybe Dr. Henry, we could talk about that separate and apart, <laughs> right? Um, I have a couple of questions coming in. Um, Mark would like to know, do any of the panelists know of issues being faced in the region by red tides or algal blooms? So anybody can take that question if you'll have the answer. I, I actually, 
one of my first topics when I started my PhD, my first um, project was red tide, but I was in Boston. I was studying at a university in Boston. And that was a long time ago. That was around 2006 when there was a big influx of red tide and me in Massachusetts and Rhode Island were losing millions of dollars from the fishing, the um, shellfish industry um, producing these poison shellfish. Um, the red tide doesn't make the water poisonous, but it makes the shellfish poisonous. So it affects the shellfish and industry. And okay. that's the, the project I was on when I learned um, that you could bring together physicists, biologists, chemists to, to predict things like the, um, the influx of red tide. So there are models that exist and have been used by Maine, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and other US states to predict and work around for the, the shell fishing industry. Where, where, where can you fish? Where, where should you stay clear of this summer? Things like that. So I think if the technology exists to understand red tide, yes, it does. Um, what is being done in the Caribbean Sea? Like I said, I was 2008, I was working on that question. So that's been, uh, time has lapsed and I actually don't know what's being done specifically to the Caribbean. But at that time, th these models were being built to be used in all the US states that were affected by the red tide back over a decade ago. <laughs> so meaning that if a decade ago they were developing models, the, the models are mature by now. And so the tech, my comment is that the technology exists for understanding red tide. Okay, so should we want to use the technology, it's available. Yeah. Okay, yeah. all right. Um, because I haven't really seen much about that either. Um, I try to, you know, not be involved in every single thing, but just to know little things here and there. Um, but I've never actually seen that before. So I, it's brand new to me too. <laughs> um, I don't know, Tim or Livina, you, have any, you guys have anything to add regarding that question, or we can move on to the other question. You guys have anything you want to add with, with red tides or algal blooms is concerned in Jamaica or St. Lucia? Uh, nothing to add. Um... Okay, no problem. And I want to also thank, uh, thank Dawn for sharing um, the information about Johanan. Um, and his work with Algas Organics. So thank you very much, Dawn, for sharing. Appreciate you. Um, so you guys can read up more, a little bit more about him as well, if you wish to. Uh, so we have uh, another, before I jump to the other question, um, I want us to, to discuss about, well, actually, let me, let me take the question now. And this question is for you, Dr. Henry. Um, in regards to the alternative fertilizer made from seaweed, what do you see for the future in our region in replacing, this is from Sherika, in replacing chemicals and farming with this new fertilizer? So um, do we foresee any problems with marine pollution transferring contaminants or hazardous chemicals to the processing of this type of fertilizer and what is in place for testing? Did you get that question? You need me to read it again? Yeah, because no, it, no, I heard it. So okay. I think... So a big part of every innovation is understanding. And so her question is a valid question and it's some of the things that we're considering in the work. Like I said, we started two years ago asking this question. Um, one summer, one of my students walked in and said, why don't we look at um, a sargassum seaweed? Because we were looking at sugar cane as a source of a biofeedstock. And we realized the sugar cane wasn't as promising. So we looked at sargassum and it seemed to be a viable solution. For two years, we've been asking the question, how much biomethane can come out of this? Um, other scientists around the world have said to us, we're not getting a lot of biomethane out of the sargassum. So you seem to be lucky in Barbados. We've heard scientists say there's all these heavy metals in the sargassum. So that's a whole other step in the process of purifying out the metals. Um, but for us so far, we haven't had problems. And I don't know if it's because of what the sargassum is like in Barbados versus where um, this guy was looking at the South Caicos Islands, for example. Um, and the ocean is like that. As you move through the ocean, you'll get different chemical content, different biological content, different humidity, salinity. And so you'll have different environments as you move through the, even the Caribbean Sea from one place to the next, the sea is different. So everything we do is subject to 
what are the sustainable the laws of sustainability and is is it being violated at any point along the process what are the byproducts how do you treat with them so that you don't produce more problems than you're trying to solve um and so her question is among the uh, the thing about research is that every time you answer one question it opens up 10 more questions and so we are approaching my answer to her question i think i think here in her question she's really asking what is the sustainability of the process um we are producing energy for transport one of the byproducts will be agricultural fertilizer and so how do we approach that very complex process and the main driving principle is sustainability we think about the sdgs um 17 sdgs and how to me that project kind of touches on many of them but we focus on do we harm life at sea by our process or are we helping life at sea do we and then a lot of the answers come from cost benefit type analysis looking at well you might lose a marine turtle here or there but in the end you're going to save 100 marine turtles if this beach is clear of sargassum for example and so everything has to be done with a love for the, the natural environment and towards improving the natural environment. We're not like the oil lobby that's just after energy and after wealth. We're coming from this very enlightened kind of academic place where we, we understand um, our role in the circle of everything. And so we are responsibly moving forward. And so her question about what are the byproducts? How do you harm the rest of the ecosystem by this? Um, how, do, how does it help? Does it hurt? Those are all subject to um, the, so, so actually we start in this process with only 100 cars and we're using it to build up numbers and evidence. Like you said, your data, nerd, you call it. To me, data is just necess necessary for life. Everybody it has is. data on their phone. So <laughs> building up the data set. And so we're doing that. Um, we're proceeding very much with caution and, and are along every step of the way, documenting everything in an objective way. I mean, I'm still a, a scientist within academia and um, we're taking that approach there. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Henry. So I'm shifting now the conversation to microplastics a bit um, because we do have um, a challenge with the managing of, of microplastics as in my job as a waste educator, I see my role as making sure that the items do not get to the marine environment. So I would like to block it before it even gets there um, by changing mindsets, changing behaviors, getting people to see all of the multiple uses of waste, um, seeing it as a resource, talking about the circular economy and all of, the, all of that good stuff in between there. So Timoy, um, in your work with the United Nations Environment Program, um, you know, what, how are you guys dealing with the issue of microplastics? And I know that might be a, a bigger question. So let me see if I could drill it down a little bit more. So I know the, the UNEP is response, it oversees many of our region, or many of our islands, sorry. Um, so is it that data, so let me ask the question this way, is it that data comes from the island states, which is aggregated by the UNEP or does the UNEP have its own microplastic projects um, for different islands in the Caribbean region? So Timoy? Okay, with regards to UNEP, so we have done significant work on in the area of microplastics um, in different parts of the Caribbean and a lot of this information is actually available on our website. However, I would say that the issue of microplastics is is a, is a difficult one as, as, it, as it relates to removing the microplastics from the environment. Um, um, there's an example of where there's a talk to remove microplastics from wastewater. However, that in itself is not a practical solution of, of addressing the issue and it has a high cost associated with it. Um, so as you mentioned, the main focus would be to manage the plastics through reducing its use and recycling proper disposal before it gets to the stage of microplastics. 
So a lot of work, work that UNEP has done, um, persons can visit our website to see what we have done with regards to the microplastics issue. Uh, Sean, you're, you're on mute. As we, thank you, Temoy, my apologies. As we on that same topic, um, you know, what are some, in St. Lucia, has there been any mitigation strategies or any work regarding uh, microplastics specifically? It can be through your office or any other um, organization that you might be aware of as well. Okay, um, I'm not aware of any work that we have done with microplastics in Tenutra, but there are individuals who are working on alternatives to like beauty products that contain the microplastics. So we, we it's like changing mindsets. You're on mute, John. So the, the level then um, is, because I'm so concentrating on muting when I'm not talking. <laughs> I forget to, to unmute when I want to talk. Right. Um, so the in St. Lucia then, the, it is at the level of the entrepreneur um, making or developing uh, businesses, programs, systems that will deal with the microplastics. So is there is there anything on a governmental level or no, there isn't anything at it? Not as yet, no. Not as yet, okay. It's, um, it's, um, it's something we know we have to put forward to address plastic pollution. Okay, I see. All right, so I see we have, okay, so Sharika is asking this question to Temoy. Do we have any data on the association of microplastic and human health for our region? Yes, there is data um, um, with the association of, association of microplastic and human health. And I will share that with you, Sean, so that you can um, send it to the participants. Yes, please. That would be awesome. Thank you very much. Because I would love to see what are some of the findings regarding um, specifically health, you know, because one of the things with microplastics is the whole issue of bioaccumulation and biomagnification, um, especially since we as human beings are at the top of the food chain. So I'm also very interested to see what the studies have shown um, regarding that, because I know in Trinidad and Tobago through the Institute of Marine Affairs, they have a number of projects. Um, they've actually done some tests on fish um, so far that I know of. Um, and they want to do some other projects as well. The latest one, um, the last one that they just released, not related to plastics really, but it's kind of related to waste, but it's about mangroves and mangrove restoration. Um, but they have started doing some work um, in Trinidad regarding the impact of microplastics on human health, specifically as it refers to fish consumption. So I would love, so please do share that with me and I would um, share it with everybody as well for their information. So thank you so much, Timoy. Uh, the next question by Andrea, what is being done to adapt infrastructure to increasing use of one-time use plastics, litter, sewers, exact? flooding, microplastics, and collection and handling. The last time I was in San Fernando and Port of Spain, even with a little rain, there was localized street flooding. So that question might be for me. <laughs> um, I will talk specifically about what is happening in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, there hasn't been that much work in terms of retrofitting um, systems to manage the uh, influx of materials, waste materials that would be entering into our drainage and sewer systems um, to collect. There is an intent I know of, but I have not heard of anything starting just yet. As Andrea mentioned, um, it doesn't have to rain for very long, especially in the capital city of Port of Spain and the entire city is flooded up. And you would see all the plastic bottles floating and all this stuff floating down the street. We have a huge issue um, with that and now, 
the city of Port of Spain, which is our capital city, there is a revitalization of the capital city project, which is being spearheaded by the city Port of Spain City Corporation um, and the urban development um, company called Udacot and through as well, partially through, it's a, a private public partnership, it seems. Um, I went to the public consultation where they showed us their plans and so on. Um, but another gap that was missing there was how, how are we dealing with the simple um, issues? The issue of, and is they're not really simple, but in our minds, we want to build more buildings. We want to create fancy things, but we're not dealing with the issues on the ground, which is, um, the, our drainage problem. The city of Fort of Spain has been developed over the years, but we have not dealt with the drainage system, the sewerage system, the septic system, mm -hmm. all of that as more buildings come on. Um, we're just adding buildings and adding to the, the current systems without upgrading them to be able to handle a higher influx of material. Hence the reason why we have such a huge flooding problem in the capital city, because we have not um, have changed our drainage network really. More buildings are being built all the time, but we have not really dealt with that. And of course, we do have a mindset problem when it comes to littering. We still see people just dropping things on the side of the road. We also have an issue with a lack of frequency of waste collection. So the bins tend to be overflowing um, and they're not collected often enough. Um, so that overflow of waste gets onto the road, gets into the drain. And when it rains, we have the huge problem. So um, that is where we are at in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, one of my questions to them was to look at that, was to look at education programs, was to look at the institution of recycling bins in the capital city, was to look at our drainage network or sewerage network and see how that can be retrofitted, upgraded, um, fixed, <laughs> where it needs to be um, so that we could effectively deal with this higher, um, the higher volumes of waste that is being generated because we have not really changed it in all of the years um, that we have been developing the city of Port of Spain. So Andre, I hope that answers your question. Um, so Sean? Yes. Sean? Yes? Quickly before before we move on, I'm sorry, no sorry, Lavina. Just want to say that um, in terms of the infrastructure with our drains, especially in Jamaica, and the high volume of garbage that um, that ends up in our what we call our gullies, um, into goes out to the sea. Um, there has not been much infrastructure change at that. However, I was involved in a project a couple of years ago where. Um, we tried to um, basically implement a boom, a debris containment boom at the mouth of a gully to be able to capture the waste that was coming down from um, a specific city in Kingston called Montego Bay. Um, it was, um, it, it taught us a number of lessons, uh, which include that um, we need a, a stronger boom to to a stronger if infrastructure in place to accept the waste, um, the boom, it did not really, it wasn't able to fully manage the volume of waste that was coming down. So um, I just wanted to point out there that there are alternatives to, to try and capture the waste um, if it is that we're not able to change the infrastructure as it pertains to the, the gullies and so on. But, it should be more to see how best to uh, make uh, these solutions work within the cities that we live. Excellent. Um, Dr. Henry, you wanted to say something as well, too? Yeah, I, I actually just saw a few of those going around on social media, and I remember yeah. seeing them. Big things like I that. saw them. They look like big nets. Yeah. I saw them, too. Mm-hmm. Um, I just want to say, though, um, the increased runoff, another thing is population dynamics. And this is what, I mean, when we say development, we think big skyscrapers going up. I remember when Patrick Manning had this big drive to change the skyline in Trinidad. And he did. He changed the skyline in Trinidad. 
But mm -hmm. I think when we think of development, we have to think about it in many ways. And development has to start here. And it doesn't start with the tall buildings. And part of it is managing the runoff is actually about managing the trends in development. So in fact, the sargassum blew, I know we've stopped sargassum, but the sargassum blew up in the Caribbean <laughs> Sea because of increased runoff in South America, you know. There's mm. more nutrients coming out of the big rivers coming out of Brazil. And so all of that nutrients entering the ocean causes the big bloom of sargassum we're now seeing in the Caribbean Sea. So it's coming over from West Africa as it always did, but now the bloom just blows up and it comes up um, into, uh, it circulates up into the Caribbean Sea and then it's trapped by all these islands. So it's really like the, the best, it's like um, all the best conditions for it to blow up. And that is because of trends in settlement where it's getting built up, where you have increased runoff. And so, we're seeing it within our localities in, in Jamaica and Trinidad in, where, in, in all our different islands, but and the, the flooding is, is, is everywhere. And that's because of the trend of development. That's what we think in our minds as development, but also the, the human behavior that's like a whole, um, because what, how do you explain flooding crises going up simultaneously in all these countries around the world? Right now is our real new problem. Anytime you get rain more than 20 minutes, there's flood and crisis throughout mm -hmm. the Caribbean, but not just the Caribbean, around the world as an issue. And I think it's because around the world, all of us think wrongly about what development is. We have this incomplete definition of development and we see we're dealing with the consequences now. I have no um, So Lafina, you go ahead, ask away. Ask away. First thing I want to say. In St. Lucia, with regard to the infrastructure, we have attempted to build a sieve in the city to um, capture the plastic. But I was wondering with you as well, have you put in any bans to importing or using single-use plastic instead of just amending infrastructure but mm -hmm. to have a ban so it doesn't come in at all. We so don't do have any. Um, so to answer your question, um, Lavina, we don't have any bans. The last talk that there was going to be a ban on the importation of styrofoam products only. However, we manufacture 60% of the styrofoam that we use. We only import 40%. So even if we were to impose a ban on the importation of styrofoam, we still make more than we import. Um, so <laughs> as for me, um, that makes absolutely no sense. <laughs> I'm just being fun and honest with you all, because we make more than we import. So we're still going to have um, styrofoam. And that was the only uh, product that the government was looking at imposing a ban on, right? Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of, especially when it pertains to more so the food containers and not necessarily the single use plastics like the cutlery and, you know, the forks, the spoons, that kind of thing. So that's where we are. Um, there has not been any further talk about imposing any bans. Um, I have my own personal opinions where bans are concerned, um, because I believe that they cannot work as a singular solution. They have to be done in tandem with very innovative, creative, enforceful education um, and the right laws surrounding it, um, because recycling in Trinidad and Tobago is voluntary. It is not mandatory. So right now we are um, trying to affect people's hearts and minds to make a better decision um, as it pertains to the collection of their recyclables, but they don't have to do it. It's not law, you know? So mm -hmm. we still have um, a ways to go where that is concerned. I tell people I have, I think I have the hardest job in the world <laughs> uh, because I'm trying to shift mindsets in a place where all of the supporting, uh, or the, um, all of these supporting things are not in place, um, but still trying to encourage people to do what they can with what they have where they are, you know? So that is what I have been um, trying to do through my work as an educator. 
So guys, I'm going back to the Q&A. We have a few other questions coming in. Um, so I'm just gonna ask from the top. Um, Mohammed says, we live in Lebanon. Um, he's a WASH specialist, um, the Lebanese Association for Medical Protection. Could you support us technically through some personal support regarding the organic fertilizer process as the quality that we are having is very bad and the operation and maintenance costs are high. So Mohammed, I don't know which one you, if it's Dr. Henry you're thinking through her, um, her work at the university um, in terms of you getting support for what is happening in Lebanon. Um, Dr. Henry, you can say if you guys are the position to share any information. Um, I know- yeah. I feel like his question is pointed at John. Um, this the solution from Lavina, Jonathan, Johanna, and Dujon. Oh, okay, it's, okay. So, um, what he would be organics, yeah. Okay, so what he can do is well, that might be the best person as well because yeah. he would have tried, tested, proven. Um, so I think he is on social media. He's on, he's on LinkedIn, he's on Facebook. Um, Algas Bio, um, Bio Fertilizer is on, he has a Facebook page. So, you, so Mohammed, you can try those. Use the links that um, Dawn just sent in the chat um, and you can backtrack to see how you can contact him directly. Um, Lavina, if you have a contact or an email address or you can get it, that would be great. So we could share his email um, with Muhammad, so they can ask him their relevant questions. Oh, All right. So, get it for you. That would be awesome. Thank you. Well, so I'm next, also get mine, and I will introduce the two of them by email. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Um, so Roxanne's question is: Is it possible to receive information on how much countries spend on average for coastal cleanups for, for with particular that's the in ICC day, which is the International Coastal Cleanup Day, and who funds? Um, like Jamaica government funds, but Grenada, for instance, depends on donations that amount to an average of about four thousand U.S. dollars. And Jamaica, for instance, gets funds from the TEF. Timo, you can tell me what TEF means. Sure. <laughs> sure. Like sure. sure. I that. So mm -hmm. TEF, the Tourism Enhancement Fund, and that is under mm -hmm. the of Tourism in Jamaica, and they are responsible for you know ensuring that or or our island is kept clean and a number of other things that they're involved with. So in terms of uh, uh, beach cleanup, the International Coastal Cleanup Day, um, mm -hmm. they have been the largest donor in Jamaica. Um, okay. the Jamaica also, in, for ICC, we also receive funds from corporate sponsors like private sector, um, individual private sector companies would also sponsor ICC as well. Um, so... Basically, that is how ICC is funded in Jamaica, and it's a long process of, of you know, submitting proposals to the government for this kind of funding. A lot of reporting is being done, but they do, um, they have, over the past 10 years, they have funded largely or national coordination of international postal cleanup day here. Okay. Um, Lavina? Do you know about what happens in St. Lucia? I can tell you all about what happens in Trinidad because I've been a part of the ICC project for a number of years. Um, where does, um, does St. Lucia participate in ICC in the International Coastal Cleanup? And yeah. where does it receive funding from? Our Caribbean Youth Environment Network. Mm -hmm. CYN usually champions it. Okay. Um, they get donations as far as I know. Mm -hmm. um, but we have tried to see what we can give to them. I don't have an idea of the exact cost. Okay. But for this year, for example, they wanted to get masks and bags and gloves for undertaking the cleanup. Okay. Um, in Trinidad, we are similar to Jamaica in the sense that um, the International Coastal Cleanup is organized by the 
CNIRD, which is the Caribbean Network for Integrated Rural Development. They are the focal point. Um, so what happens is that we also do get corporate sponsorship. Um, so Coca-Cola, Nestle, you know, those kinds of companies would sponsor. Um, but then because it's also the committee is made up of uh, state agencies and some private organizations, they are responsible for funding their own um, activities. So if they say, so let's say, for instance, the Trinidad and Tobago Solid Waste Management Company, Swim Call, is responsible for Hearts Cut in Chagaramas, which is a bay in the western part of the island in Trinidad and Tobago. So Swim Call was responsible for taking care of everything, um, for getting the mask, getting the gloves, getting the um, the pinchers to pick up things from the ground. Um, if they want to do t-shirts, that's up to them. But they would be responsible for footing that bill. Um, the other sponsors would just be responsible for supporting the launch events um, and other general events. But each individual organization is responsible for their particular area that they choose. So they have to set aside the budget annually for the international coastal cleanup. Um, Dr. Henry, you know of it in Barbados, and do you know how how it works at all? Would you have any information about that? Yeah, okay. So I just know Barbados is unique in the region. Barbados is a country that I guess right now they have a policy to be fossil fuel free by 2030. They make ambitious goals. Um, Recycling is just a normal thing in Barbados. Um, one of the problems I noticed when I first got here was there, were, um, there was a shortage of garbage trucks. So it was actually to your benefit to recycle because mm -hmm. your garbage bin was just, I realized like we moved on January 1st and by the middle of January, our house had the most garbage in front of it because the garbage truck wasn't coming. But when okay. I looked around, my neighbors had like literally no garbage and I just had all of this garbage. I'm like, what's wrong with us? We just, these trainees embarrassing the country <laughs> on this street. And then I realized people were managing the, their waste. So you will, um, there's bees recycling, which is the biggest recycler on the island. And mm -hmm. people would separate out their waste and take it, take over recycles to bees. And so you have less garbage and the front of yours waiting on whenever the garbage truck comes. Since then, the problem with the garbage truck has been solved. Um, but still, though, it's a strong part of the culture here that people recycle. Um, and it reminded me of when I lived in Boston, where you weren't allowed to, um, to just throw. You had to pay a dollar, one US dollar for every garbage bag. The garbage truck was not picking up anything without the seal of the city of Malden on it. I live in a like suburb of Boston. And mm -hmm. so we didn't want to put out all of that money. So we did recycle. And so the recycle bins were much bigger than the garbage, right? right? And so I saw that was policy regulating to get more people into recycling. Um, in terms of beach cleanup and stuff, because Barbados is a tourist economy, I've never seen a dirty beach in Barbados. It's like the beach is always pristine. So I just think <laughs> It's part of the economic machinery of this country to make sure that these things happen. I don't know what specifically happens in terms of beach cleanup, but I think um, the, the, the beaches are managed because that's the, the bread and butter of, of the country. Yeah. It's just Trinidad and is oil rich, and we don't care how, how right. dirty the beaches are. Uh -huh. in this <laughs> exactly. Um, and, you found, and, and you would find the same thing in Tobago, eh? because Trinidad and Tobago were two, two islands, one country, but when you go to Tobago, you would find that the beaches are cleaner as opposed to when you go to when you are in Trinidad. So, um, and because tourism tourism is very very high on the agenda of the Tobago House of Assembly, which is which manages their their um, I'm just sharing this for everybody's benefit because the Tobago House of Assembly manages their affairs. Um, and they get you know subventions from central government, which is in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, you would find that. You don't have the, I mean, even the streets, just the streets, not, not even that the beaches alone, the streets are clean, right? Um, and there's a complete contrast in Trinidad. So, um, because we still have this thing that, okay, we have these people who are being paid to clean, so I helping them out. That's how we think, right? Um, I remember doing a presentation in a secondary school and a young man said, miss, if I don't litter, then the people will have nothing to do. And I'm like, what? So it is, 
That's to tell you, and, and, and he only thinks that way because the adults around him think that way. And that's how they behave because children absorb things from their environment. So my children know, okay, this, my daughter is, I call her the recycling guru in this house. She makes sure, she's seven years old, she makes sure everybody does what they're supposed to do. If we don't do it, we get buff, right? And she's seven. Mommy, you're not, mommy, you forget, right? So it is really important. That, and that's why I say recycling in Trinidad is voluntary. It's not mandatory. So I am trying to encourage people to look at exactly what you said, Dr. Henry, just taking out your recyclables alone, you'd realize how much less you throw away. Just taking out your organic waste alone, you'd realize, I mean, some of my, because uh, I teach home composting, right? And some of my students was like, Shad, I, instead of going out every day to throw out my garbage, just once a the week, yeah. you know, so. But I, I would say the, the two times that I really got into recycling was when it was forced on me in Barbados because the technology yeah. was missing and in Boston because it was, being enforced yes so Correct. i think the solution in in a place like trinidad would be policies and um re actual restrictions on on the yeah. population yeah because i mean exactly. that would make my job a whole lot easier <laughs> but um you know we do need the supporting legislation we do need the supporting laws to you know to just boost what we're trying to do because there are some people, yes, it will, it will, you could talk to them, it will affect their hearts and minds and they will change. And then there are others again who need, they need the policy, they need the law, they need the big stick. All right. So let me see if I could squeeze in a few more questions. I'll go to say chuck in. <laughs> That's a Trini thing. All right, guys. Um, so I just wanted to, Sharika, when you were talking about regional development, Dr. Henry, um, and you're talking about the, the, the concept of development and how we think about what development is. Um, Sherika wants to know, do we have a regional development discussion and collaboration to protect our regions from practices that might have jeopardized our environment on, and the population um, in terms of uh, a regional development discussion? I think, I think um, just quickly, I am in the academia, so I know about UE, and I think there's a lot of efforts and, and investments in UE around this idea. And I think we need to hold our university accountable to getting the things that are being said in academia out there in actual legislation, as Dazi Woody just used here. Um, so I think the regional development is something that's done, and I mean, which is something that's studied in depth, discussed in depth, PhD, 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 journal paper, journal paper, journal paper. And now we need to start seeing it out there being implemented in actual laws. Um, we are talking about microplastics and people using plastics and use that Coca-Cola fund, some of the things, and Nestle. These people are the big corporations responsible for all the global um, mass of, of um, plastic out in the oceans anyway. And we don't hold them accountable because we don't see it as part of our development to hold corporations accountable. There should have been mm -hmm. an anger about Coca-Cola in here, but we're just like, yeah, Coca-Cola pays to, for the beach cleanup. They're paying for the beach cleanup after they put 70% of the plastic out there. Yeah. So that's like a greenwashing going on where they just like, well, and then I paid, paid for beach cleanup. Um, so if we had more out there and not in the Ivy Tower of academia that the average Trinidadian speaks about it, I think we would have a different approach to these things and we would have more anger and, and pull the, the corporations more responsible as well as ourselves, yes, but it's, it's like, I think it's, it's a wider net we need to cast and um, a lot of what's being done in academia, I think, needs to be out here being implemented, being um, part of the regulations. Right. And just going back, what you are specifically talking about is extended producer responsibility. That is what is going to hold the manufacturers, the producers accountable because the, the caveat has also been to that the information from the international coastal cleanups have been sent to those companies to say, hey, the majority of plastic water bottles that we're finding belongs to you. The majority of, we call it soft drink or soda, 
right? Bottles that we're finding on the beach belongs to you. What are the majority of um, bags that we're finding belongs to you. What do, is your plan about it? And the funny thing is, is that they themselves have thrown their hands in the air and said, well, eh, you know, they pass it on the, to the consumer. But it just, <laughs> I was just talking about these things just up to yesterday and the fact that we have to hold, especially when we're talking circular economy, we have to hold our producers responsible. So not just give them a pass for, um, supporting, and I, you see my air quotes, supporting projects, but really getting them to, to be held accountable for what they're making. Make better items for us consumers, because we all are consumers. Just make better products so that they can be disposed of um, in an environmentally sound manner. Um, there's a question about bands as well. So as we were talking about that, so going back to us, I'll start at with Lavina now. Is there what bands are in? Let me see if I could find the question because I don't want to do the person any injustice by not asking the question in the right way. Um, right. So Jennifer wants to know about single-use plastic bands. So um, Timoy, you could start first, and then I'm um, sorry, sorry, Lavina, you start first, then Timoy, then um, Dr. Henry. Um, what bands exist in your countries, and are they working? And do they have? Is there a plan to have any more bands to come up? So, um, Lavina, what are the bands in Saint Lucia? Do you think they're working? And is there any plans to institute any more bands? And then Timo, you can answer the same question. And Dr. Henry, if you can speak on Barbados's behalf, what is happening there? So, Lavina. No problem. The ban was announced in 2018. And from the 1st of August, 2019, there was a ban on importation of styrofoam food service containers. And because of COVID, we had an amendment made and there was an extension. So the importation of use now, no, the imp there was a ban on importation and there will be a ban on use of these materials. Timoy? Okay, all right. So in terms of Jamaica, the ban started in 2019 and it started with the uh, plastic bags or t-shirt bags, or scandal bags as we call it here. And that was followed up with uh, a ban on plastics that was a included also the ban on plastic straws and followed with styrofoam. First, it was the importation and the manufacturing. So it's been done in different phases. But what I have to say about the ban in Jamaica is that it has been, has some success to some degree, um, specifically with regards to the bags, because you see people having more of the reusable bags being used. However, you still do see the, the, the scandal bags, as we call it. Um, still kind of creeping back in. There's been also success with the straws to some extent. What has not been very successful has been that with regards to um, the styrofoam because there's been alternative um, food containers made from plastic replacing the styrofoam that has become a new issue to deal with and the government has acknowledged that and I guess it's are looking at ways on how to deal with that issue as well. So that is the response for Jamaica. And one more thing from me. Um, you had asked if it's working. Yes, it's working. Persons are more willing to switch to alternatives, especially as they are more aware of the dangers of single-use plastics. And Sean, you are muted. I am happy to know that it is working um, because as I told, I was, as I was saying, you know, they, the, the bands can't be seen or looked at as the singular solution. Um, so guys, I want to thank you all very, very much. What we will do is that we will take a note of all of your questions um, and they will be sent out to all of the panelists so that they can respond and then the answers will be sent back to you so that you will get your answer, your questions answered. 
although you didn't get them answered immediately in this session. Um, so I will answer some of your questions as well. So to Dr. Henry Lavina and Tim, I will answer the questions and Swetha will send the responses back to you. So guys, I want to say a huge thank you firstly to um, my panelists for joining me today. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your schedules to be with me and to be a part of this discussion. I also want to thank Switha and the Be Waste Wise team for once again facilitating this discussion about um, waste in the Caribbean generally, this one specifically about marine litter. And to our attendees, thank you so much for asking such engaging questions um, and for really sharing some of the resources that you guys have as well with us um, so that we all could be aware of what is happening um, in our Caribbean region and by extension, the rest of the world. So guys, thank you so very much for joining us. We trust that you enjoyed our session. Um, and we will be in discussions about if we're having another one, you know, so y'all could push me with wise and ask them for another one. <laughs> but thank you so very much for joining me, everyone. Do enjoy the rest of your day and be rest assured that you will get the answers to the questions that you've asked. Thank you so much, guys. Be thank well. Thank you, Sean. Uh, thank you to all the panelists for taking the time out today. And just to add to what Sean just mentioned, uh, this webinar will be up on our website in two weeks' time. Within that time, we will get the responses to the other questions that's there. All the responses will be up on our website. So please uh, sign up to our newsletter. You will have an update when it's up on our uh, website, and you will be able to get all the responses. And over there, we will also put out the additional resources that uh, the panelists discussed that they will share with you. We will not be able to send this out individually on email, but everything will be up on our website. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Good evening. Good night, wherever you're at. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.